Welcome to the 14th common session of Sunoikis' Digital Classics 2016. Today we have two guests from the University of Leipzig and the common session is about uh, annotating geographical data, annotating and visualizing geographical data. We already talked a bit about that in February when we had a common session about name entities recognition, but today we have a specific common session for geographical data and we have two experts, Chiara Palladino, who is working on Greek and Latin sources, and Maxime Romano, who is working on uh, classical Arabic. Uh, you have uh, the links to the YouTube video and also the link to uh, the class outline in GitHub where you have a detailed description of the common session, assignments, uh, readings, and also links uh, to repositories. So, Maxime and Chiara, welcome uh, to Sonoikis Digital Classics. Um, uh, Chiara, welcome back, and thank you for your contribution. So, I think you can start, and I think that uh, uh, Chiara is uh, uh, going to start. So if you can hear me and you can see the presentation, yes, can you I, hear me? Yes, yes, I can and I see your slides. Okay. Perfect. So I think that we could start. So welcome, as Monica said, to the 14th session of Sunarchus' Digital Classics and uh, two preliminary things. First of all, I apologize for having made the syllabus available with such a short notice. Uh, as a partial excuse, I have to say that setting up this session was particularly problematic and that one of us, uh, Federico Aurora, will not be able to be here uh, as previously announced to present his material, so it's just the two of us. And secondly, you probably already know at this stage, but should there be any questions, please do not fear interrupting us um, as most of the time we will be sharing our screen and we will not be able to see uh, the chat most of the time. So first, uh, I will make a very quick recap about <clears throat> uh, what we discussed about in, in the previous session about named entities. Um, so essentially, what does it mean to annotate something, in this case geographical data? Uh, basically, an annotation is the equivalent of what you do when you do a scholarly annotation. Uh, when you annotate something in your textbook, either adding information or identifying people or places, uh, in any case, you make a statement about something, and that's essentially what digital annotation is as well, uh, but without pen and paper, obviously. And um, so a particular data model for annotation workflows in collaborative environments and frequently in, in the digital humanities in particular is the open annotation, uh, which, is, which I use as a case study as an example for explaining you what an annotation is. Uh, which is essentially a way of connecting a target that is a document or, or an object or whatever you're opening with or you are operating with, uh, with a body that is something external to a target but related to it in some way. Uh, so for example, in this case, you have a document with the mention of a place and your annotation connects it to the place name identified in a gazetteer as a URI. Um, so <clears throat> At the same time, uh, annotation can be standoff or inline markup. Uh, and some of you may already be familiar with it from the previous synarchy session about the encoding of ancient texts. Uh, and as you know, you got inline markup where the annotation and the annotated data are incorporated in the same location. That is, in this case, for example, the edition of a text or a document. Or standoff markup. There is a kind of markup that is placed uh, in a different location from the data that are being annotated. So if you remember, we started with the concept of annotating places, named entities, <clears throat> and place names as we showed them to you were quite strictly defined and were recognizable. Um, and they are the core of any type of research on geographical topic anyway, uh, because as long as you can identify a place and give it coordinates to it, um, then you already have a context where you can place your research questions. And again, just to to, to refresh your memory, gazetteers are the most important part of this type of research, and they are essentially repositories of georeferenced places that are collected together as URIs, unique resource identifiers, whose function is to ensure the uniqueness and stability of <coughs> the ID. And there are several different gazetteers according to the historical period, the context, and so on. And however, uh, while, for example, for the Greek and Roman world, and in general, for the Western world, we have very good resources such as Pleiades, for example. Uh, for other contexts, we are not 
as much uh, as, as lucky as in the Greek Roman world, for example. Um, however, space is not just about place names. Uh, and it is related to a wider notion of place than, the, than just you know, conventional toponyms. And so we realize that if we want to be able to fully exploit the research possibilities offered by geographical data, we need to include other factors in our vision of space. <clears throat> and we should also consider that geography is experienced and lived within a context, within a society, within a culture. It is transformed. It is connected to other entities, time, people, and so on. So we do not just aim at representing space meant as places put on a map, but at representing spatial practice, that is how societies interact within their spatial context and how places are related together through human and natural transformations. So we need to address geography and geographical data as a broader notion than just place on a map. And we need to refashion a bit our approach to the annotation of relevant spatial data. <clears throat> and we are going to use our specific topics of research as case studies to let you understand what we mean. So first of all, we'll quickly, quickly give you a definition of geographical sources in the Greco-Roman world. And we have several types of technical sources that are, for example, the Pericle. Uh, there are lists of places along the coastal line connected with distances or indications of directions. We have guided tours that are mainly on the inland. and. Uh, a very problematic subgenre that is the, chor the choreography. <clears throat> and in the Roman world, the itineraries that are lists of stations connected through distances are particularly popular, and they are pretty much the equivalent of Pericle, but on the inland and not on the coastal line. And we have, obviously, uh, the major geographical resource, which many of you probably already know. And we have the so-called minor geographers that are technical office schools that are mainly identified as uh, the most strictly geographical sources that we have. <clears throat> so one thing that you should consider when dealing with this kind of geography is that its origins and purposes were strictly pragmatic. Uh, so pre-modern societies in general, not, the, not just the Greeks and the Romans, did not have a sufficient degree of abstraction for using maps as we do. And even if, as you may know, the Greeks or us were able to measure latitudes and to represent a grid of coordinates, they didn't serve the purpose of traveling. And so for traveling, there is a very really well established theoretical distinction between cartography that was essentially speculative <clears throat> and what we call hodological space, uh, which provided the key, the key concepts for finding the way through space in concrete. So simply put, hodological space is the kind of reasoning that you do when you have to explain to someone the way to go from central station, from central station to the university, for example. So you refer to certain geographical points, to certain reference points uh, that are important for you or, there are, or that are conditioned by environmental factors, for example. And you decide the route and you establish, for example, a time span that is essentially entirely personal or conditioned by the environment. Um, now, the slight difference with pre-modern societies is that they use the same mental process to, exp to explain the route, for example, from Rome to Istanbul. Uh, and we wouldn't really do that. So <clears throat> how did they find a way? And to what should we pay attention to when we deal with ancient Roman? So um, our sources have essentially three types of data that deserve our attention. Uh, so the first one is obviously distances. Uh, and in ancient sources, in medieval sources in particular, the numerical estimate of the distance depends on the concrete conditions of travel. And you have a large variety of units of measurement in the, way, in the widest way possible, actually. Um, we have essentially two different types of systems of orientation. One is fixed in the sense that it um, uses reference points that are pretty much conventional. So you can use winds, you can use compass points, you can use stars, and so on. And one that is unfixed, uh, so that it is based on cultural references or environmental factors and so it is obviously <clears throat> unsystematic and, and typical of some societies. Um, then you have what is called uh, the mental model, so the cultural aspect of spatial practice. And um, in this case, uh, it is essentially the association of certain concepts, for example, boundaries, to certain places and to certain regions. And this mental process also conditions the way space is defined in a cultural context, and therefore, 
we should pay attention to it also when we look at for definition of place or place name. So I will show you briefly what I mean in practice. Uh, this is a very concrete example, a uh, concrete itinerary. It is not the only one that I could make, but it's very simple and very straightforward. So we first have, in this case, named entity. Imagine that we have to annotate the relevant spatial data in a very traditional way. We have named entities here. However, in this case, we can easily see that places are not limited to proper names. But there are other special entities that deserve to be treated as such. Then, we, as we said, we have distances, obviously. Then we have two different indications of directions. The first one is conventional, uh, in this case, compass points. And the second is more difficult, uh, and it is mainly based on relations between places. And if we look at this example closer, we can easily see that these annotations are not necessarily isolated data sets. Um, in fact, all these concepts are connected together, and places are obviously described in terms of their relations with other spatial entities. Uh, so everything is connected, and even the indication of a distance is based on a relation between two places, essentially. One is the point of origin, and one is the point of ending. So we could probably indicate the majority of these annotations in this way, uh, in order to emphasize the place-relatedness that is the basics. So ancient and medieval spatial systems are defined by relations between two places with an edge that can be a distance estimate, a direction, a conventional direction, or something that is more vague, uh, underspecified, so an unconventional system of orientation, as we mentioned. Uh, so how do we deal with all of this? And how do we annotate geographical and spatial entities? Um, so we have essentially two uh, issues in this case. One is more pertaining to semantics. So how do we annotate different systems of place relatedness, essentially? And how do we annotate this overlapping between concepts and place names? And then we have representational issues. So how do we, vi how do we visualize uh, this bunch of things as a spatial system, and how we make it useful for us? And what do we use it for? So one thing that we already know is that we, are, that we have uh, tools, actually we had tools, uh, for annotating place names. Um, and if you do not know what Recogito is, you can just follow the link or go back to the previous session on the named entity recognition. And actually, maybe not immediately, because we just came to know that Recogito has been act um, last night. But everything will be fine, don't worry. And then we have other types of uh, ways for encoding spatial data. And I'm starting with um, TI and EPIDOC standards, um, retrieving some, some indications from the guidelines. We will treat the subject more in depth in our session about editing geographical and lexicographical data in June, if you're interested in spending your summer holidays hearing my voice again. Uh, but I will cover it shortly to give you an idea. Um, and I immediately have to say that maybe this is not the ideal way of annotating spatial data. Um, and it always depends on the type of work and purpose that you have in mind. And you may be interested in encoding some types of geographical information in your text directly. But you should be aware that whatever system you choose to perform your annotation, you should be strictly consistent and choose a strictly consistent, consistent encoding strategy. So in this case, um, just one, one very brief disambiguation, what we mean by encoding geographical information. We do not mean what you see here. So what is the context, uh, the geographical information that pertains to the provenance of an object or of a document? In that case, you have very specific indications for encoding the find spot and the last time the object was observed, and so on. And the EPIDOC guidelines supply you with all relevant information. And you have a very structured way of doing that. On the other hand, we want to encode relevant spatial information that is contained into the text. So spatial information as the document, essentially. Um, and in this case, we must go back to the TI manual and to especially Unit 13 uh, about how we do we encode information rele relevant for places. And we have some strategies, some very basic strategies to do that. So the first thing that you should consider is obviously using the place name element. And one useful way of using inline markup in this case is to specify the reference of the toponym to an existing gazetteer using the ref attribute. Um, 
I would like to focus on few specific encoding strategies for the moment uh, that are used essentially to encode relationships between places. Uh, you can use the offset element, for example, <clears throat> in order to annotate relationships between one place and another, uh, indicated by means of directions, essentially. Uh, if you want to encode a distance, you can use the measure element. However, I would advise you to uh, specify the type of measurement that you have and the type of unit that you have, especially if you're working with ancient texts, because the units of measurement can be very, very inconsistent. The element geo is used by default to encode standard coordinate systems, um, but it can be modified also to, for example, have the markup from a different vocabulary. So, for example, the keyhole markup language, the KML that is used by Google Maps, and it is useful if you have actually georeference information. Relation element is often a time saver, and instead of finding markup strategies within endless nestings, you can make a rational use of this element as far as your encoding is consistent and useful for you. So this element can be used for, for expressing relationships or connections between various sets of entities, not just places, but also persons, dates, names, and it offers you the possibility of further specifying the type of relationship. So you will need to be extremely consistent in expressing your data, and it will be advisable to provide a list of the types of relations that you use um, in, a, in the type attribute in order to you know, have a valid list and a consistent list of the types of relations that you use. Even better, this element is quite useful if you already have an established semantic specification. Uh, so it, if you can retrieve that from an ontology, for example. Now, if I didn't discourage you completely from using TEI for annotating your text, please note that there are easier ways to perform annotation on geographical data depending on what you want to do. Particularly for semantic annotation, we have some possibilities, some further possibilities. Uh, a very simple way for annotating semantic categories connected to places, if you're working on a project which involves papyri or epigraphical sources, for example, is to do a taking part in Trismegistos places. And Trismegistos Places offers you different types of annotation workflow, uh, two essentially. The first one concerns geographical data which are external to the source in itself, but are specific to any text bearing object. That is the information about the find spot, essentially, the last time it was observed, and so on. And the second one concerns geographical information that is contained in the sources. And in this case, following Trismegistos Places, you can also do very detailed types of research. If you're interested, for example, in a particular categorization of places, if you want to see how many toponyms are mentioned in a specific document, uh, if a toponym is mentioned in how many documents you want, and so on. And recently, Trismegistos has evolved to a more advanced approach, so they have started to tag spatial entities in a broader sense, paying particular attention to the context in which they are mentioned. So if you take part to the project and if you are interested, to, if you are interested in doing that, well, first of all, you should let me know because I would be interested in understanding what you're messing up with. But um, you should contact the team and you should uh, get fam familiarized with, uh, with their workflow. And you will be able to annotate several types of things that are related to the toponyms mentioned in your documents. So for example, the status of the toponym, its categorization within the text, explicit or implicit, uh, whether your toponym, for example, is um, mentioned as a boundary, is mentioned as a village, uh, anything that you can imagine. So this is particularly useful if you have a very specific research question. And we are also going to have a very good system for annotating semantic categories and various types of orientation systems in Recogito itself, if Recogito recovers, <laughs> but it will, uh, from the hack of last night. Um, so the new version of the tool uh, will enable you uh, in a few months to be, um, to create actually your own data sets of annotations. So you will be able to annotate pretty much everything that is relevant to you. Um, for example, place categorization, whether it, it is explicit or implicit. Uh, if you can, you can annotate also different types of entities, of named entities, such as people, for example, if you're interested. Uh, but also any kind of relation that is relevant to your source. So for example, administrative units, um, categories of places, distances, numerical data, and so on. One limitation that all of these easier methods have 
is that they have not that they are not open to everyone at the moment. Recogito will be in a few months, but uh, anyway, it is not like setting up your own annotation workflow and having it at your disposal anytime you want, and that's where you come in, Maxim. <coughs> Uh, okay, so um, I would like to talk uh, a little bit about um, an alternative method of annotating geographical geographical data and text, and actually also not only about geographical. It applies not only to geographical data, but uh, um, in, to uh, to data in, in, in general. So, <clears throat> um, next slide, please, Kara. So uh, more specifically, I'd like to talk about uh, um, uh, about this uh, a markdown, uh, which uh, um, I've been developing for working with Arabic texts. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons of uh, uh, developing the system was that uh, using uh, uh, TIXML uh, is uh, rather problematic with right-to-left texts, um, especially if uh, 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 the script uh, involves um, um, complex uh, complex writing system like Arabic. When when <clears throat> technically um, computer have to uh, has to um, reconnect letters uh, right on the screen in, in front of you many many times uh, because that's that's how the uh, the writing system uh, in Arabic is, is organized. So that, that creates a lot of problems, and, and one one of those issue, one of the issues is that uh, all the uh, bidirectional uh, symbols like angle brackets, which is the the main uh, one of the major symbols in in XML, uh, behaves rather erratically with uh, when uh, right to left and left to right texts are put together. So um, uh, while, while it was primarily developed to tag structural uh, elements in Arabic text so that it could be then easily converted into uh, uh, into TIXML so it could be used with all the available resources for working with, uh, with XML, um, <clears throat> I found it also uh, convenient uh, for using with uh, um, um, for tagging information that 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 uh, I want to extract from texts, uh, and a particular example here, which I'm which I'm uh, going to talk about, is uh, uh, extracting toponymic hierarchies uh, from uh, from comprehensive geogra geographical text, from comprehensive Arabic geographical text. Maxim, sorry for interrupting you. Um, we we have talked a lot about the TIXML during these common sessions. Can mm -hmm. you say a few words about Markdown? Because I think this is the first common session where we see the use of Markdown, and you have a, a specific, precise examples. Just a few words. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. It's actually on, right on the next slide. So if uh, if Kiara takes me there, uh, nope. Nope. Before there must be yes, this one. So, okay. Uh, okay. so yeah. So here's a spe here's a specific example, um, and and uh, um, uh, the um, the annotated uh, passage is uh, um, nope. Uh, Kara, one step forward, please. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and here's here's a specific example. In in the Arabic text says uh, um, the regions of Arabia. Are as follows. The first of them is Al Hijaz, then Yemen, then Oman, then Hajar. So we have a toponymic, uh, a toponymic hierarchy uh, in the sense that we have a region, uh, um, uh, we have a province, and uh, we, which is made up of uh, four regions. So, um, and the next line you have here is, is a, um, an annotation that describes this relationship in, in a structured order. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense if you if you try to, uh, from maybe from the first um, um, from the first look, but in fact what what we have here is um, uh, uh, sort of a custom tags uh, introduced into the text that um, in, introduce regularity into information, and that's exactly what what any kind of tagging system uh, system does. It, it um, um, 
it uses a certain um, a limited set of uh, of combinations of symbols that that relate to particular ish, uh, particular entities. So what we have here is uh, as as you can read um, um, there are essentially uh, uh, two tags um, hashtag dollar sign hashtag followed by a description of what it is. So that's a province, and then the value, the province is Arabia. Uh, then another uh, um, uh, hashtag dollar sign hashtag type that describes, uh, in this particular case, what kind of type uh, uh, of regions it has, uh, this province. And then another one, um, uh, hashtag dollar sign region level one. So it has uh, the following regions which are here given and separated by uh, hash hashtags. So, um, again, even though that may, may look a little bit disorderly, in fact, this information here is stored in a format then you can, then you can easily uh, process with a script. You can extract it and reformat it uh, into whatever, um, um, whatever data structure fits, you, uh, fits your particular needs. Um, so, does it make sense so far? Somebody nod, somebody say something? Yes, I, no, no, thank you, thank you. It okay. was just to say, what is Markdown? Yes. Because, uh, but we have a good example, so okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, so Markdown initially uh, goes, uh, goes back to the idea of, uh, of the actual Markdown without capital A and R, uh, when, when um, a very simple principles, a very, very short tags used uh, for um, for what is later converted into full tagging in HTML or any any other formats, um, and so so uh, which which makes it much easier to write uh, um, uh, encoded text and so on and so on. Um, so um, Kiara, if you if you uh, go one step forward, yes. So he, here's here's an example of that information uh, when it was first tagged in in the uh, in the Arabic text. Uh, using that uh, um, custom tagging system. Um, then we use a script, um, which you also develop, develop yourself, and, and uh, reformat it into, um, into whatever d data structure you need. And then you can visualize it with available methods to show particular um, uh, um, whatever is that you, you, you're looking for, whatever is it you're going for. And in this particular case, what you see is the division of the Islamic world into major provinces. Each province then is divided into region, and each uh, region is divided then into uh, into settlements that that are part of that of that regions. <clears throat> so um, one one more thing about about Markdown here is that um, um, with all the advantages of TI, uh, it's overly standardized and. Uh, um, you often need to figure out what your standard is in order to annotate something. Uh, it's on, it's, it, uh, and um, what I, I'm afraid may happen sometimes is that the standard may start, may start dictating what your research, research questions are. Because if something cannot be annotated, it becomes really problematic how to work with that. So um, one, one of the uh, sort of way around uh, um, 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 about, about this is to come up with your own tagging system, collect this information, uh, check if what you collected actually provides you uh, with some some kind of pattern that you can study. Because you know, if if if, if you come across only a small number of uh, entities or relationship that that you annotate that do not provide you with any uh, uh, value for historical or linguistic research. Um, you, you kind of end up wasting wasting your time. Um, so in here you can you can annotate data the way you want, uh, and then after you have enough information, you can convert it into um, um, into TI XML and have it in a standard way, which allows them to to use it in um, <coughs> um, um, in, in a with the standard means that, that that we have available in such quantitude. So um, uh, next slides, uh, Kiara, if you can, if you can move me there. Thank you. Yeah, that's just uh, that was just another uh, visualization of uh, the same structured uh, uh, data, and um, th then we can um, 
this this is another visualization, visual representation of, of the data that it can be collected from the sources. And then we can start mapping it for visualizing the divisions. Uh, um, um, in, in this particular case, my research question was, was uh, how can we better represent uh, the, uh, the space um, um, on a map, how the Islamic world was divided into regions, and, and uh, uh, what were the extents of, of, those, of those regions. And here you can, you can see that uh, uh, the major settlements are uh, dots of specific colors, and these different colors represent different regions of the Islamic world. And the next one, uh, yeah, and, 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 and this one uh, is another way of visualizing this data, uh, also to try to understand how different regions are related to each other, uh, which shows you which shows you how um, settlements in different regions are clustered together. And uh, as you, as you can see here, each each region is essentially um, kind of separated from uh, from each other. Um, uh, often, if you if you look closer, by uh, unlivable territories. So. Uh, I think that that would be okay. So the next the, the next step. Um, so we talked we talked about uh, um, annotating and extracting information from text. Uh, now what I'd like to to talk very very briefly here. You have a link on top, uh, which has all the information all the uh, all the files necessary for um, for the tutorial that that I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and uh, essentially, one 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 of one of the problems that you often run into, and uh, if you work with Greek and Latin, you are lucky to have Pleiades. So you have, uh, in in order to build a map that we we've just seen in in, in the previous screen, uh, you need to have coordinates for each place that you want to put on a map, and that's what what uh, um, often uh, what's often problematic uh, when we talk about um, uh, ancient or medieval uh, places. Um, so one of the ways, one of, one of the ways, and perhaps the, the most efficient way of uh, creating uh, this data uh, uh, that is collecting coordinates for places that, that you can find on modern maps is to find a printed map that has all those places and georeference it. And uh, georeferencing is, is a method of uh, um, um, taking an image of a map uh, and, and uh, um, uh, aligning it uh, with the um, um, what's the word I'm looking for with the um, with the coordinate grid um, you can use um, some kind of, um, usually you can use some kind of GIS uh, solution geographical information system and one of one of the solutions here, which is offered in in this tutorial, is uh, a QGIS, a free um, uh, open and an open source uh, software. So um, uh, I won't be um, talking more about this because this is this is a practical uh, uh, this is a very practical assignment. Um, and uh, you can follow the link and you can um, uh, follow the steps w which are described there, and you can try to create uh, uh, all the data on your own. Um, okay, that's probably would be it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh, Maxime, uh, yeah, I have one question for Maxime. So, uh, for as for the annotations and markdown, so do you manually annotate place names in your text? Do you automatically annotate them? How do you work on them? Yeah, that's that 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 depends on what, what uh, on a particular research question and on and on a type of uh, of a source, because um, um, yeah, and depending what kind of a geographical information uh, we actually have. So this this is an example here is a comprehensive geography. So um, um, so the methods that that uh, that can be used for annotating comprehensive geography would would differ from let's say annotation of geographical data in biographical in, in, in biographies uh, and and uh, here of course uh, um, uh, the there's there's no kind no um, no same solution for all for all situations um, this text requires for example this comprehensive geography uh, definitely requires uh, manual uh, annotation uh, and quite careful and what you what we have here is 
annotation is put right next to the text itself uh, in such a way that it can be removed if it's if it's um, um, uh, if you don't want to keep it uh, uh, and at the same time it's right with the text so you can always uh, modify and, and work with it. Uh, when it comes to biographical text, uh, uh, for example, and, and uh, as, as, you, as, as you and Kiara know, I work with very large biographical text where uh, manual uh, annotation is very difficult because uh, you, we have uh, uh, Arabic tradition is very, very rich in, in biographical sources and we have tens of thousands of biographies. So uh, there I'm trying a I'm, I'm, uh, uh, semi-automatic method of annotating um, using lists that automatically tag uh, toponyms in the text, uh, which uh, then can be uh, manually disambiguated. Um, so, and in, in using different uh, 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 approaches from uh, computational linguistics, like n-grams, so you can um, you can use words that precede the toponym to sort of uh, improve the precision of your automatic identification of, topon of toponyms. So that's, uh, that's, that would be it. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, this is important. So how to combine manual and uh, automatic work. And sorry, going back to the slide, I was seeing where you have page note is the page of the actual book and the note. And then you have the volume and the number of the page and the note. Is it correct? Y yes, yes. Okay, yeah, sorry, I don't read Arabic, so but of no, course, no, no, it's no, clear. No, 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 no it's good. good, because it's good. Even if you don't know the language, the structure is very clear. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, thank you. And, and just one more thing, and, and you also have here that the, the uh, note, uh, another one, one of the tags here is page, uh, yeah. which tells you volume and the page number, and another one is note. Yeah. So volume, page, and, and the number of that note exactly. uh, in, in, in the text, so yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank and, you. And, and, the, and the more important thing is that all this can be converted automatically into TI XML. One yes, more standardized yes, use. Yes. Use, and yes. then this is a very great example. So, if we, especially for manual annotations, it, it, it's fast because uh, we know quite well that when you annotate, you, when you tag manually, it's, it's very long. I know quite that. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> sure. Right. Um, so we focused uh, on on various strategies for collecting the data, and now we want to show you some some concrete applications. So we're using geography for understanding other things. Um, one of the first experimental examples that that we have is actually for providing uh, a geographical reference to to a literary work uh, belonging to to the Greek tradition. And it, is, and it is obviously Hestia. Um, Hestia was a very experimental project that wanted to explore the interaction between the geographical dimension of, of one text, in this case, and the cultural background. So in this case, we use geographical data to understand literature more than history or more than society. And they have uh, they, they built up a database of georeferenced toponyms. Uh, all of them were found in the text and were actually annotated and together with some additional data about place categorization. So essentially they cover three types, settlements, natural features, and regions. And this database was the core of the project, and it has been used for, for basic tasks, uh, so for graphs of, of frequent, uh, for visualizing frequencies in, in the text, how much uh, certain toponyms are mentioned uh, in, in Herodotus's text, and so on, and secondly, in order to use uh, network analysis, essentially, so to visualize how places are linked together in order to identify connections uh, based on textual co-occurrences in this case. So what you have here is actually several types of views um, when you uh, actually access to the website. You have a comprehensive view of all the places mentioned in the text, which obviously doesn't tell you anything. You have a reading view that is actually uh, a reading help while you are reading the text of Herodotus, you can see the geographical context of all the places mentioned, and you can obviously see, uh, if you switch to the place view, the network of the most frequent connections with one selected place. And this uh, visualization was actually aimed at allowing literary research, essentially. And the interface that you can see here is actually an application of GAPVIS, which was the, visual the visualization tool of Google Ancient Places. 
and the aim was to combine so various types of visualization, the map, the narrative time timeline, the reading panel, the text, and so on, so that the readers could switch between locations and connections and the text and the connect and then the, the statistics of the, the frequency statistics of dimensions or various toponyms. And one of the purposes of establishing such networks was to get a sense of how strongly the narrative is related to particular geographical areas and to see if these areas are strongly demarcated or not and whether they are connected to each other or, and how and why. And at the same time, a comprehensive view on the connections can quickly give you a sense of how the historical and political perception and the focus of the work actually changes across time. And one of the last experiments made with this data has been performed by actually one of our colleagues, Thomas Heffer, um, who created this very simple visualization of the comprehensive graph of place co-occurrences in, in the history of the Persian Wars. And it is very experimental and it obviously raises questions about how we select place co-occurrences, but it is still pretty good to see and I recommend you to open this link and to see the video. Uh, now one uh, slightly more complex uh, visualization tool that you can use in order to see, uh, to experiment actually how, how travel systems worked. Uh, in this case, in the Roman world, is Orbis, the Stanford Geospatial Network model uh, for the Roman world. Uh, Orbis is essentially based on an algorithmic model that calculates uh, a wide range of variants that condition different types of travel. Uh, in antiquity, would be, be, but with particular regard to the historical situation of the Roman Empire and to the third century, uh, and in the context of the Roman road network of that period. So it is very, very uh, strictly contextualized. Um, and if you are interested in that period, it allows you to recreate the concrete conditions of travel, um, and if you want to experiment according to a given source, if you have it. So you can simulate uh, communication networks uh, in a given time span according to various conditions uh, in the context of the Roman Empire. Uh, and it allows you to generate uh, various types of simulations according to time and expense and to connect uh, any given sites, essentially. So you can use Orbis if you want to accommodate your traveling models, if you have a research uh, of this kind and to calculate various options of routes according to your research questions, essentially. So um, to essentially crash test your own assumptions about how did, it, did these people travel and to, to evidence, more or less. Uh, and in general, the measurement of routes in Orbis is determined by this algorithmic model that measures the distance uh, as the segment between two nodes, essentially, and determines the shortest path uh, according to the variance that you choose. And if you want to use Orbis, first of all, I would advise you to have a look at their tutorials. There are video tutorials. There is a, a very full documentation, documentation section. Sorry, um, And you can play around to see the various possibilities that it offers. Um, on a very basic uh, workflow, what you have here is uh, the interactive map. And uh, you refer to the to the route map if you want to establish, for example, an itinerary between two places. Uh, you select uh, two toponyms as starting point and ending point, uh, and you can actually use the drop-down list uh, to to see if the toponyms of your choice are are actually in the database. You can select various types of of conditions, so you can select the month to which uh, the itinerary is measured, the season. Uh, you can select various types of network models. You can select the type of route uh, according to the fastest, the cheapest, and the shortest route. Um, you can also select the types of um, road, the types of uh, means of transportation, the transfer costs according to, obviously, the, the currency of the Roman world and so on. And then you can calculate, actually, the real route. And the result is also shortly explained in the bar you see below the gray one, uh, which gives you various types of detail about the duration of the itinerary, the distance, the various uh, some variants in the means of transportation, and so on. And you can also retrieve a network diagram that calculates the cost for traveling from one to one chosen site and all the other sites in the network of so your choice. So you can calculate calculate actual, actually various types of itineraries, and. You should also remember that you can actually 
calculate different types of routes according also to uh, the places that you choose. You can click on any place that you can see on the map and you can exclude or include various sites. You can decide to use those places as starting or ending points of your route and so on. So you have actually total freedom to play around with, the, with your chosen itinerary. So as I said, you have the network function. You can calculate essentially the costs between one side and all the other sides uh, that you have chosen. And if you uh, recreate a network, you can also play around with uh, the dynamic distance cartogram that essentially gives you uh, a sense of the costs um, of the priorities uh, according to the costs in terms of time, in terms of expenses, uh, in terms of distance. Uh, so it kind of distorts the, the, the map that you see. Um, and if you want to see the normal map according to uh, this criteria, you just click on Georectify and you just get and you are just given the, the normal map. If you click on zones, on the other hand, uh, you can see um, essentially the cost contours according to the specific types of transportation costs or according to the various regions that are selected. And finally, if you click on flow, uh, you can generate uh, a particular type of diagram that is a minor diagram. Uh, so essentially a diagram displaying various types of data essentially quantitative data together on a map, uh, and I'm simplifying, obviously. Uh, but in this case, the diagram allows you to calculate all the most efficient routes uh, from one to, to one other selected site. And it aggregates them to show you the most used paths, essentially. And in the bar below, you can see what are the most active routes uh, to your own chosen site. Um, connected according to the toponyms or the, the most relevant toponyms. So you can actually play in around with it with this tool. And we have some proposal of exercises if you are interested in, in testing your own sources or some given sources that we have um, to see the concrete conditions of travel in the ancient world and just to play around if you want. So we have now a variant of Orbis that is actually for <coughs> a different type of source. Yes. Um, so back to me. Um, what what we have here is um, um, is a model of the uh, uh, Islamic world. Uh, it's in in many ways inspired by by Orbis, um, and it tries to adapt it to adapt the principles of uh, of Orbis to um, to the Islamic world, um, mainly uh, of the 10th century uh, CE. So um, the, um, this model is um, much more simplified uh, in, in, in a sense that uh, we don't have so many, uh, so many parameters and algorithms uh, integrated into, in, into this model. Um, what it does mostly is shows you uh, the shortest path and uh, what, we, what we called here within a day path, uh, a path that would try you, would, that would try to lead you through um, regions uh, where you can um, um, uh, travel between two places um, within one day. So you're living in the morning, and uh, by the end of the day, uh, you get you get to uh, to the next destination point, and you don't have to. Uh, spend your night in the middle of nowhere um, uh, in a hostile environment. So, um, Kiara, could you please take the next step? Yeah. So, what you can do here um, in using uh, using this model is you can also build an itinerary uh, from one uh, from um, uh, among multiple places. Um, you go to pathfinding and you start selecting uh, selecting places. So here we we start in Samarkand in Central Asia, in, which is in uh, in top right corner. And uh, next one, here. Uh, and let's say we travel to Baghdad, uh, and it shows you what what's the what is the shortest path between between Samarkand and Baghdad. Um, uh, you can build this itinerary um, in in um, in multiple ways. So you can add the next uh, um, traveling point. 
So here we have Damascus, or Dimashq as it's called in Arabic. Um, and here you, you see that you get two alternative paths. The first one, the red one, will be the shortest one, but that will take you through the desert, uh, which, uh, uh, which means that you'll be very short on resources and um, you would most likely try to avoid that unless you're really pressed to get, uh, uh, to get there as, as quickly as possible. And the alternative path that takes you through a much more relaxed environment <coughs> uh, through Jazeera, um, uh, the, the region which is now sort of equally divided between Syria, Turkey, and, and, and Iraq. Um, um, I, don't, I don't think I have, I have more slides here for, for this model. No, nope, you don't. Go back, please. Please, go back. Thank okay. you. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, go back. Thank you. Um, but uh, here you can also you can also try to build um, um, to check different different things. You have uh, a network which um, uh, you can select a place and it will uh, show you how far away places are from uh, from from a particular point that you choose. Um, which um, uses the same the same approach as as uh, um, uh, in Orbis um, that looks into um, into actual travel distances rather than the uh, the map space, which is often very uh, confusing actually because if uh, the road may look uh, short on a map, but in fact it goes through mountains or, or some other hostile terrain. And the uh, the travel will actually will be times longer than going uh, on the water, traveling um, traveling on the water, or going um, uh, over um, a plane. <clears throat> so it um, so that network um, shows you uh, shows you the extent reachable within a particular um, uh, particular time period from from the, the place of your choosing. Um, the uh, the other things here regions borders and colors also also try to um, visualize extents of different regions uh, and actually I've, uh, we've seen this uh, the slide uh, just just, be just before of that um, and a couple of other things so uh, but by and large this this is a, a project in development um, so but you can still try and, and, and do something with it. Uh, one of them will be uh, also the su suggested assignment is to try to is to um, choose an itinerary of a, um, of a medieval Islamic scholar and try to map it using using this path pathfinding uh, um, um, algorithm here, and uh, you can you can uh, compare it with uh, um, how efficient his itinerary was in terms of choosing the shortest path. Um, traveling from one place to another. So um, I guess that would be all for this. And, and now about something completely different uh, is uh, how we can use uh, geographical information for, um, st for studying, let's say in this particular case, social geography uh, through bi biographical data. So Monica asked me about how, how we're tagging information in, in Arabic text and one of them uh, and I mentioned that we, I work a lot with, <coughs> excuse me, with biographical information. So, um, in in particular, um, I work with a very large collection that covers seven centuries of of Islamic history, which is shown here, roughly from 622 to 1300. And uh, um, if we look at, at if we look at, at these at these biographies, which are 30,000. And we and we collect geographical data from from those biographies. We can try and and look at um, how different regions, how different places, um, uh, were prominent in the course of this rather long period of seven, seven centuries. And here you have one of one of example of uh, 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 of the major early Islamic centers. So um, the, the graphs show uh, the number of people associated with those with those regions, and you can see that Medina, which was the capital of the of the early uh, uh, caliphate, and Bas Basra and Kufa, which were the first garrison cities outside of Arabia on on the border with Iraq, essentially, 
uh, how prominent they were in the early Islamic period, but then they disappear, uh, and we don't we don't find many people associated with those regions. On the next slide, uh, we have we have graphs of intermediate centers, uh, those that that are prominent um, in in the sort of um, uh, in the middle of the period that this source covers, and you can see how prominent Baghdad is here. Um, the black, the black line, um, but not everything uh, is good in Baghdad over over the period, um, uh, and um, the um, the fall, the, this, the the following part of a graph, uh, essentially shows you what happens to Baghdad right before the Mongol invasion and after the Mongol invasion, um, after which it never recovers. Uh, in a similar way, you can see other Iranian cities; they they have the same kind of the same fate according to this source, Isfahan and Nishapur, and also Cordova and uh, 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 a city in, in Spain, the capital of, of uh, Muslim Spain, and Andalusia itself in general, Spain, uh, also prominent in, in, in the middle of a period but then, then disappears. Uh, and the next one, and here we see Egypt and Damascus um, <clears throat> and how, how their fates uh, sort of uh, quiver in, in the course of this of this period, and you can you can see in particular how Egypt is gets uh, sort of rises gets prominent, but then it practically disappears in 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 the um, um, about like 12th century, uh, and then it recovers. And the sa and uh, uh, and you can see also how prominent Damascus becomes by the end of the period compared compared to other places. So, so th this this is um, this is what we can do with with geographical information applied to um, other kind of information. In this case, biographical. So, uh, but that's not all. Another thing. Uh, next one. <clears throat> we can also look at the biographies and and uh, um, look at what kind of toponyms are mentioned in those biographies. We can represent each individual uh, as a, um, as a network. Uh, and in this case, you, what, what you see is four different ways of how, uh, um, uh, of how uh, a network of each individual can be, can be visualized. Uh, and that depends, uh, the way uh, which model you would use depends on what kind of data you have. So the first one, uh, uh, this uh, letter C uh, means the uh, um, center from which person starts if you have that kind of information and and uh, in this in this case what we have is is person who's uh, um, who's uh, um, from Basra and his biography mentions Kufa Baghdad Medina and Mecca and we sort of we draw lines that that connect that, that individual uh, to those places the second model uh, uh, a way of showing geographical network shows tries to create an itinerary from from uh, from biographical information, which is unfortunately very often problematic because we have toponyms listed, um, not necessarily in the order of how person travel sort of moved from one place to another, um, and that su such way uh, 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 such modeling uh, such visualization becomes really problematic. <clears throat> and the third one uh, shows um, a kind of um, a way of okay. What if we oh, what if we connect every place with every place in this network, and we will we'll get a shape of of uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of a geographical network of an individual, um, and uh, um, here we can also accommodate if a person lived for a significant amount of time in different places. In this case, we have Basra and and and, uh, and Baghdad. So. Uh, so so actually, the third I'll skip on the fourth model. Um, um, so, oh no, I won't. The, thir the third one shows this A and C uh, circles show that uh, we have some information about, uh, about the fact that people live there um, uh, in those places long enough so that we can consider them, uh, in this particular case, we, consider, we can consider the person to be a Basran and, and, and a Baghdadi, like um, Anna Monica, she is a, in Tur a Turian and she's also in Leipzig, so she's uh, in, in both places. Uh, and the fourth one is uh, shows only the connections, uh, only the network, and we don't have any information about where actually person was staying for a significant amount of time. So what we can do 
um, then the next step would we can combine these networks uh, of of uh, into um, a, by chronological period. So, for example, this one shows a network of uh, all biographies that we have for the period from 700 to 800, uh, and and uh, and it's also um, scaled up. So the the one that uh, the one that we had before, uh, the, the model that I was show, show, we were show, we were looking at, at here, yes, it, it has um, um, cities, right? So it connects the cities. But if you try to to map every single city on on uh, put every single single city on the map, you'll get a very um, uh, unwieldy spaghetti monster. So can we go to the next one? Um, and what and um, so here uh, all the toponyms that belong to a particular region are combined together, and and the network graph is uh, simplified. So, but what we what we see here is that we have strong connections, uh, stronger connections between Arabia and Iraq, Arabia and South Arabia, uh, Iraq and Iran, and uh, Iraq and Central Asia. So, if we take a look at the next century. We, we can see how these connections change, start changing over time. So we have a very strong connection between Iraq and Iran, um, and and uh, um, connections with South Arabia almost disappeared. But we start, but the connections start also going into other regions, right? Uh, next one, um, next one, um, and at this point you can see that Al Andalus, Spain, uh, uh, appears quite strongly. Um, almost competing with Iraq and Iran, but it's not it's not as integrated into the Central Islamic lands at, as the lands as the Central Islamic lands are integrated with each other. Um, but as we move along, um, one more, we can see how these connections change over time. And then in this particular period, um, which historically was a lot of turmoil in all these regions. Uh, we can see that people start traveling uh, very significantly um, uh, across across pretty much the entire Islamic world from Iran to to Spain. Uh, next one, one. Oh, okay, here. Can you go one back? Sorry. So here we we see another another uh, region starts becoming more 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 prominent, Syria and Egypt, and that's if we look at the period, that's the period of Mamluk. Uh, um, uh, caliphates, uh, sultanates, sorry, uh, in in um, in Islamic world, and as we move along, we can see how uh, orientation uh, of different regions uh, changing. So here we see the rise of the Ottoman Empire, and very strong connections of the Ottoman Empire with the Arab lands as well as Iran and India. But as we move along, a few more slides, you will see how. Uh, in the Iranian world and Turkey Arabic world are falling apart and sort of uh, become um, uh, prominent uh, macro regions. So, so this this was an example of uh, another example of how we can use geographical information um, um, uh, for studying lots and lots of other interesting things. So. Uh, Maxime, one question. What kind of biographies you are working with? Mm. Mm. Biographies of whom? So okay, yes. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, in our case, in, in, in all these biographical collections, of course, we find mostly individuals who, are, um, who belong to, to the elites. So we're talking about people who are writing, um, in most cases, religious works, uh, people who are involved in the transmission of knowledge. In most cases, it's religious knowledge. It's the uh, transmission of hadith, the words of the prophet. Um, so yeah, we, we, we unfortunately, we don't have information on, 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 on simple people. Uh, uh, mostly, we're dealing, we're dealing with, with the elites. But that's, that's, the, situation, <laughs> that's the situation everywhere, yes. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, another comparable in size uh, uh, um, you know, amount of biographical information would be China, uh, and of course we're also dealing with people who hold some um, some kind of administrative offices that gives the ground of people to actually consider them to be important and to write some details about them. Uh, but at the same time, you can you can see that that the patterns of uh, 
even if we're talking about elites, uh, we, we can see that the patterns are changing, uh, that regions are, uh, are connected to each other uh, differently in different times. The certain regions become closer to each other, then they grow apart, and it's constantly shifting. It's constantly and it's constantly changing, and and that's the that's the um, that's the that's a very interesting and valuable part of it, I think. So, thank you, thank you. Sure. So, uh, back to Chiara then. So yeah, no, I think we are, we are over with time, right? Uh, we, we, I do not think we have you still uh, other have, things uh, to Yeah, okay, you still have 10 minutes, but I don't know if uh, uh, there are questions uh, or... Um, so, in the audience, do you have questions? Uh, I'm looking at YouTube, uh, if... Uh, No questions? <laughs> well, we, we have seen many, many things. Of course, uh, as we know, annotating uh, geographical information is not easy for, well, we, we have seen for many, uh, many reasons. And then uh, um, we, we still need uh, authority lists, uh, for example, for BRICS sources. Uh, we have, we still need uh, uh, authority lists, in, for example, in ancient Greek and Latin, because uh, uh, we have to annotate the texts in the original uh, language. So maybe we have lists of place names in, in, in modern languages referring to ancient time, but not uh, in the original language. So this is another uh, problem with Greek is an inflected language, so it's not easy to to do that uh, automatically, but, th but it is something we need. And then, of course, what do we mean by place name is a big question. And Chiara, <laughs> at the beginning, uh, showed us um, something. Um, and then, definitely, the work of Maxim is, is, is precious because you are annotating this text, again, to produce, as far as I see, and as far as I understand, authority lists with Arabic uh, uh, place names. If I if I can add a little bit more here, so um, I've showed two uh, two different examples of work. One was uh, focusing on geographical texts, and the goal here goal there is uh, is actually to to convert this hodological space into some kind of uh, comprehensive visualization on and. Uh, um, uh, that, that one can actually understand because we, we have, for example, we, the research problem here is that we have uh, about a dozen of these uh, comprehensive geographies and uh, you, can, you can compare one small passage in, 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 in one text with a similar passage in another, but the question is how can we, um, how can we see the extent of differences or similarities in the entire text when it describes the entire Islamic world? So producing this kind of this visualizations would allow to sort of overlay uh, the representation of this text and, and then compare how, how these texts are actually connected to each other um, and, and um, whether they build on each other, whether they, you know, they, see, they see the Islamic world differently on a large scale. So that 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 was um, that, that was one, uh, one one part of the research question, and the second one, of course, is 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 very different. That one is trying to um, kind of grasp this um, moving and changing shape of the Islamic world. Um, one thing we dis we discover is that yes, it's constantly changing. Uh, wasn't much of a secret, but 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 still, uh, the 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 minutiae of these changes is is very interesting, and that's what. Uh, of course, evades when you, evades you when you when you try to um, to kind of to study it in, in tradi with traditional methods. Yes, and I think that the challenging thing is to use. Uh, we are using modern tools of visualization for visualizing geographical information that was perceived in a very different uh, 
uh, in a very different way in ancient times and also in the Middle Ages. So I like Orbis is like a, a modern navigation tool. <laughs> uh, we use them every day, but of course we are using modern tools. But uh, that's the tricky thing. Yeah, if I may add something to that, it yeah. obviously depends on your research questions. Uh, so you can you can actually. Uh, use a uh, modern map or a modern tool in order to understand certain things. But obviously you have to know that if you are questioning, I don't know, the mental model of space or something like that, um, probably a modern map is not the best thing to use. But obviously that depends on you. And and for geographical data, the, there is still a very high degree of, of subjectivity, I would say. In, in the different systems that we use to, to annotate things and to visualize things, really, really just according to our research questions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would add to this is that, um, for example, again, if, if we show in biographical information, the biographical information is a problem. So we need to make geographical information as easily understandable as possible. Um, hence, the, hence this uh, you know, uh, simplification from uh, settlements to regions and maybe even to macro regions to just to see the trends on on uh, more clearly <clears throat> but um, because for example if we if we try to use Islamic maps uh, for this uh, then then it will be completely comprehensible if if, uh, if only because uh, the south will be down and the north will be up so you know that won't make any sense to, to people who are looking at who are looking at those maps so yeah, it's 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 all about research questions. Um, that's true. Uh, yes, definitely. But it is interesting because the uh, at least this is what we we see with uh, with classical sources. I, by classical, I mean Greek and Latin. I have a classicist. But uh, so how we can reuse this data? We can use them with uh, modern visualization tools, so they are eternal in this. Uh, in this uh, in this sense, and so we can show how it is important to work with uh, with them. So well, um, I think okay. So it's six thirteen. So thank you very much for this very very interesting uh, presentation, this uh, common session. We have seen many different sources and data, but uh, this session was good to see how we can use uh, uh, the same tools for working with different sources, Greek and Latin sources and classical Arabic. And uh, this is one of our efforts, so to share the tools, uh, the, the methods, the standards and the research questions, because this is something we are learning in Leipzig. So working together on different sources, in the end we have the same uh, questions and so this is also one of the goals of the digital humanities. So thank you very much uh, <laughs> Chiara and Maxime. Uh, so as I said at the beginning we have the class outline so you have the description of this common session, links to the resources especially to uh, the work of Maxime and then in a few days we will have also your slides with other links and other uh, explanations. So see you uh, next week, next Wednesday. We have next week and the following one, we have uh, two uh, sessions about translation alignment again and uh, tree banking with uh, Anise, who is with us every week, and then Maven uh, Jovanovic. So thank you very much. See you next week and uh, good night. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.